I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, ongoing concern over anti-Semitism raising its ugly head inside the hallowed halls of the American Congress. Anti-Semitism is not new. Anti-Semitism is a sad reality of life. But America is not an anti-Semitic country. America is not France or Belgium or the UK. But suddenly, since last January's elections, there are far-left Democratic members of Congress who are mouthing vile anti-Semitic canards and are blithely supporting the single most immoral movement on the planet Earth today, BDS, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement that seeks nothing less than the eradication of a nation state of the United Nations, the State of Israel. The offenders are not simply first-term Congresswomen, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, or Ilhan Omar, or Rashida Tlaib. What's really so upsetting is that leaders of the Democratic Party seem cowed by the young radical Turks and refuse to stand up against their anti-Israel, anti-Semitic remarks. And so it was that when a bill came to the Senate floor that would punish states for engaging in BDS, Democrats seeking their party's nomination for president voted against the bill. Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, Kirsten Gillibrand, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders all voted against an anti-BDS bill. And when Ilhan Omar of Minnesota questioned the loyalty of Americans who support Israel, not once but twice, evoking echoes of the dual loyalty charges that was once an anti-Semitic trope, Democratic House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was unable to round up enough Democratic votes to pass a resolution condemning the charge. Instead, the resolution was watered down to apply to hate speech in general. And reports are that one of the writers of the resolution was Representative Omar. Well, what's it all mean for the Jewish community of America, for America itself, and for the Democratic Party. For some insight, I'm so pleased to be joined by one of the leading columnists on the American scene today, Eli Lake, syndicated columnist for Bloomberg, who covers national security and foreign policy. Eli also served as senior national security correspondent for the Daily Beast and for Newsweek magazine. Eli, I've wanted to have you on JBS for so long. Thank you so much for joining us. Wonderful to be here. Thanks for having me. Eli, take one moment. I want you to put yourself in context for the JBS audience. Who are you, Jewishly and politically? How do you self-define yourself? Well, I'm, I'm a Jew and a Zionist. Uh, I was raised in Philadelphia. I attended uh, Akiba Hebrew Academy. Uh, I also attended the Habonim Drawer Summer Camps, which is based on the Kibbutz model, uh, Camp Galil, outside of Philadelphia, in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. Um, my family, uh, we, we uh, went to a fair, uh, what's, what's known as the Jewish Children's Folk School, which is uh, interesting because I did go to a day school for high school, but uh, that was for my Sunday school education as a kid. That was uh, something in the strain of what's known as secular Judaism, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, I would say that... Um, I, I was able to kind of get a, a, a cultural Jewish education and then at Akiba Hebrew Academy, which is now Jack Barack Academy, yes. I was able to get a more traditional Jewish education. And, uh, you know, now that I'm in my 40s as a journalist in Washington, D.C., I feel like I've gotten the best of both worlds. Yes. And, where, and how do you self-define yourself politically? I would say that I'm on the center right. Okay. Uh, sometimes you could say I'm a neoconservative in the sense of the traditional way that that word is meant, meaning that I um, began in my 20s and when I was in college and high school very much on the left and migrated more to the right. But uh, I don't, I, I, try, I really approach politics journalistically, which is that I, uh, 
I don't like the word contrarian, but I, I, I don't like the herd mentality. So I, I, I don't try. I'm not an across the board anything. On social issues, I'm pretty liberal. National security and foreign policy stuff, I tend to be more on the right. Uh, I guess you could say I'm fiscally conservative and, you know, interested in, um, you know, as I say, I like to approach things journalistically and, and uh, you know, sort of approach things with a healthy skepticism. Beautifully articulated, by the way. Again, I have enormous regard every, for everything I've seen you've written and also I've heard you speak. So I'm, I'm thrilled now to be able to pick your brains a bit. And I want to just begin, Eli, by asking you how troubled you are by both pro-BDS, anti-Israel, anti-Semitic things that have been said by Cortez, Omar, and Talib? Well, I think it's a good question. I would say that, you know, there's always been outliers in the Democratic Party. You can find outliers at times in the Republican Party. Ron Paul served in the House for many years, and he, you know, implied a lot of bad things, and that these were fringe lawmakers. They were not in any way representing, uh, you know, the consensus view of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party for many years when it came to the question of Israel, yes. let alone, uh, you know, in terms of questions of the loyalty of Americans who support Israel and American yes. Jews. What was so dispiriting last week uh, was that given the opportunity to denounce and to draw a line around the rhetoric of Ilhan Omar, again, it's I'm not disturbed that one member of Congress is going to say things that I find to be offensive. That is, uh, you know, that's happened before. But you saw a kind of capitulation, if you will, to this wing of the party now. So when I saw leading candidates for the presidency putting out press releases that were saying, that were emphasizing the idea that anti-Semitism or charges of anti-Semitism should not be used to silence debate over Israel, which is ridiculous, um, that was really the most dispiriting part of it. And I would say that when House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who we should give her credit, because before she did say that Ilhan Omar should apologize for earlier remarks that she'd made when she said that support for Israel was all about the Benjamins making a reference to money and things like that, that she then sort of became her spokeswoman, saying, I spoke to her, and I don't think she meant it in an anti-Semitic way. And then the resolution itself became uh, a kind of catch-all for every kind of hatred, and, uh, and it and no longer was really about anti-Semitism. And I don't even think that a resolution condemning anti-Semitism was the right way to go. I think that given the fact that Ilhan Omar had already apologized twice and then effectively doubled down, yes. accusing her colleagues in the party of saying that Israel had demanded their allegiance, their loyalty, you know, which is a, a classic canard that Jews are sensitive and Jewish members of Congress are sensitive to, then the response should have been that, you know, similar to what we saw with Representative Steve King when he was interviewed and said things, you know, basically uh, defending white nationalism that he was kicked off of his committee assignments, and that was he was punished in the party by the leader. And it was not a debate. It was, you know, Kevin McCarthy is the, is the minority leader in the House, and that's what happened. He thought about it. He made the decision, and Steve King is no longer on committees in Congress, which is a, a serious price. And then with Ilhan Omar, something like that, or some kind of, you know, something like that should have been done to sort of say this is the problem. Instead, there became a week where the Democrats debated anti-Semitism. And at the end of the day, it, it became a, an acceptable position to say that, you know, these kinds of charges of dual loyalty are not really anti-Semitic, and that people who complained about them are just trying to silence criticism of Israel, which is an absurd thing to say if yes. you know anything about yes. the coverage of Israel and the American mainstream media, the discussion yes. of Israel on college campuses, and if it's, it's true that there are many members of Congress who support Israel, uh, overwhelmingly so, but that's because there are a lot of Americans, not just American Jews, Americans who support Israel and petition Congress as Americans, as is their right, and ask them to do that. And we have never seen anything in the opposite direction, a kind of successful grassroots movement like we've seen for the pro-Israel movement, because I don't think most Americans 
want to boycott and single out Israel. Of course. And support the destruction of Israel. Absolutely. So it's not particularly popular. Yes. Um, but yet we are now, it seems to be in a moment where the Democratic Party uh, is at least allowing, if not turning into a party that is hostile to Israel, at least it's allowing that there can be a wing of the party that is hostile to Israel. Yes. Um, and that is really a disturbing development in my view. I agree 100% with you. And as you point out, it's not simply these, you know, a handful of freshman congressmen or women who are making these charges. They are, they are not being silenced, maybe a too strong a word. There's no condemnation of what they're saying from the state's people, the state's men and women of the Democratic Party. And I wondered how you felt about the fact that major Democratic senators voted against anti-BDS legislation. Well, on that it's a little bit trickier. Um, and the reason is because there have been a couple cases in states that have anti-BDS laws where they have applied to individuals who are in, these, in this context a, an individual contractor. And so this became an argument really about the right of Americans to boycott Israel, which is the right of Americans. So I, I'm a firm believer in the First Amendment. Now, I think that this is a misreading of what these anti-BDS laws really are, but some of them were written in a fairly clumsy way, and that has been a problem pointed out by people who are on the side of the anti-BDS resolution, and that, that you know, it's important for states to make sure that these do not apply to individuals who, you know, would be considered a contractor, a substitute teacher, who in their own personal life wanted to boycott Israel. What this is really about is if you are a company that bends to pressure from the international movement to single out Israel and boycott Israel, well, then state governments, and in, that's really what this is about, is protecting, legally speaking, these state governments, will not do business with you for the same reason that many state governments will not do business with a business that has a discriminatory policy against gays and lesbians. Uh, and it's an argument that I really have to say I'm surprised that the left, who has no problem with these kinds of restrictions, um, has not really been forced to answer. Instead, they sort of make it a, a First Amendment on First Amendment grounds. So what I saw was, yes, there were the senators running for Democratic senators who were running for Congress, I'm sorry, running for a president who uh, voted against this resolution. But they did so on these, uh, what I think were misguided First Amendment grounds, but there was a sliver of plausibility there that I would not say that as a sort of clean vote in favor of BDS, uh, whereas the resolution that got watered down and the debate and the comments about that debate, which were on Ilhan Omar's comments, which were so over the line, because this has nothing to do with your right to criticize Israel in Congress. There have been plenty of people in Congress over the years who have been very critical of Israel, very critical of Benjamin Netanyahu. That has nothing to do with it. It has to do with questioning the allegiance, the loyalty of the Americans and American members of Congress who support Israel, which is what she did. For that to have even been a debate, and then to have failed that test and say that this is really about silencing criticism of Israel, is, a, is, is just horrendous. It's a very sad day for the country. Again, I think you say it beautifully. Did I hear you use the word sliver? Yeah. Okay. I want to make sure I understood the context of the word sliver. Were you saying that the Democratic candidates for their party's nomination used a sliver to vote against the anti no, a, a sliver. There's a, I'm saying there's a sliver of an argument there. Which okay, is but you understand. There have been some of these cases where there have been individuals who would have been, who, you know, who are not corporations, okay. who in their own private lives want to boycott Israel. Yes, I understand. And then they would then be discriminated against. They couldn't, they couldn't enter contracts with state governments. And that okay, therefore, but, my say is that the laws should be rewritten so that you do not apply them to individuals. This is meant to apply to Airbnb and big companies that have been pressured to single out Israel in their global business practices. And, in, and it should apply to those kinds of corporations and not individuals, because that is, in my view, an impingement on their 
First Amendment right. Yes, and you and I are both strong advocates of the First Amendment. It should be protected. Jews have always done well because of the First Amendment, even if there are times it upsets us. But the word sliver, I thought, was profound on your part. And, you know, Eli, there is appearance. And when a senator votes against an anti-BDS bill because of a sliver of a problem, which could easily have been corrected. And I didn't hear, you know, Cory Booker said, I'll vote for it if you just make this little minor revision. Nobody said that. And they made a First Amendment case where you and I understand it was not a First Amendment case. No American is, pre is prevented from supporting BDS as, as horrific as I think that is. Nobody's free speech was being taken away. And the fact is that a statement was made in appearance by all of these major Democratic figures voting against an anti-BDS bill. So although I appreciate the nuance, and I've discussed it on JBS with others, it's a nuance without a real point to it. And I believe it was a very sad day that major Democratic figures did not seem to come out for Israel against BDS. Do I? Well, yeah. Well, I, I, here's how I'd respond. I agree with 95% of what you said, but I put it in a different category than the debate we just saw with Ilhan Omar. Yes, I understand. Yes. Because they're saying they voted for it on free speech grounds, and that's different than the bad faith argument that was put forward in press releases from Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, and Bernie Sanders, and others that said, I think it's wrong to stifle debate based on charges of anti-Semitism. And by the way, the proof that that is a bad faith argument is, is, is right there in the Senate and in, the, in Congress. We know that Many Democrats boycotted Benjamin Netanyahu's speech in 2015 when he was invited to make the case against the Iran deal. We also know many Democrats, almost all of them, with a few exceptions, voted for uh, the Iran deal in 2015 that same year. And not only were they not punished politically by AIPAC, the, the largest pro-Israel lobby, in some cases, AIPAC continued to support these members in other ways, and, and the pro-Israel community continued to, to give money to these members. Um, I mean, I, I know this because I wrote about it at the time after the Iran debate. Yep. There, you know, as a member, Senator Chris Coons, he voted for the Iran deal, and he was invited to, you know, speak at an APAC event. And so in, in that, that's an example right there that disproves this canard that's put forward by Ilhan Omar and others, that if you cross Israel you know, you will face the brunt of this nefarious lobby. That's not true at all. There are, there are you know, plenty of Democrats have criticized uh, settlement construction in the West Bank, uh, and they, you, you have all kinds of criticism over the years, and it's not treated the way that she believes it is treated. What, what is where you really draw the line, it becomes not about Israel at all, but really about can Jews in America and can P Americans who support Israel be considered fully participating in the, you know, our, our political system is when you question the allegiance of those Jews. And nobody would ever question the allegiance of Irish Americans who are supporting Ireland. I mean, there's so many caucuses in Congress that we know about. There's the U.S. Turkish caucus. There's the U.S. You know, India caucus. Nobody ever says that the members of Congress who are in those caucuses are somehow disloyal Americans. It only is the case when it comes to Israel, because anti-Semitism, as we both understand, is really a conspiracy theory. It warps the mind. And they see this through this monocausal lens, that Israel is the, the, the support for Israel is the reason for all of these other things, whether it's the Iraq war or, you know, the foreign aid budget or whatever it is. And, and that is really, that's the thing that, that was an opportunity for the leadership of the Democratic Party to say, this is completely unacceptable. And that the fact that they failed this test, again, is I just put that event in a different category than what I agree with is a troubling example of how the Democratic candidates 
didn't feel that they could just come out and say, I'm against the uh, BDS movement or something like that. I only wanted you to take one minute on this question. Mm -hmm. The Democratic House Majority Whip is Jim Clyburn. And mm -hmm. he, he came out with a statement which in essence said, Omar, who was in a refugee camp recently in her life, she understands the pain better than the children of Holocaust survivors. What did you make of that comment? I mean, I think he really misspoke, and there's a real problem with that quote for a number of reasons. Um, and it's not an either or. It shouldn't be, you know, I'm sure that of Ilhan course. Omar did experience a lot of pain in a refugee camp, but that does not, that should not be sort of judged as more relevant uh, or, you know, uh, you know, on a hierarchy of, of pain, you know, to the, the living memory for children of Holocaust survivors. Um, and uh, so I think he misspoke. I, I have to say I've covered Jim Clyburn's career for a long time. And he has not struck me as somebody who had the bug of anti-Semitism. But if I could say something else about all of this, which is sort of related to it, um, and that is another reason why this episode is so troubling is to compare it to, and I'm, I don't know if you're I mean, I'm sure you are, uh, Jesse Jackson's remarks in 1984 when he was running for president. Yes. And he was caught... Uh, you know, in off-the-record comments referring to New York as Jaime Town, which Correct. is completely unacceptable. And he had not a he, he sort of defended his associations with Louis Farrakhan. Now, that was an example where originally Jesse Jackson, in the first months of that controversy, was as defiant as Ilhan Omar. He said, I'm not going to be silenced, and all of the kind of tropes that you hear. But over time... Not only did Jesse Jackson come around, and it's really worth listening to and digging up on the Internet, his 1984 Democratic Convention speech, which is, in my opinion, one of the most eloquent apologies in the history of modern American political rhetoric. But eventually, Jesse Jackson really internalized that lesson. And when he would, in the future, through his activism, he, would, he was particularly sensitive to the memory of the Holocaust and to the experience of Jews and to the evils of anti-Semitism, to the point where, for his 60th birthday, uh, Jesse Jackson was one of the featured speakers for Abe Foxman, the former uh, and legendary executive director of the Anti-Defamation League, and that originally, you know, Foxman was, you know, leading the kind of effort to say, to say, this is completely unacceptable with Jesse Jackson. He managed to turn a foe into a friend, and Jesse Jackson, to this day, you can have, I have a lot of criticism of Jesse Jackson. Don't get me wrong, but you cannot say that Jesse Jackson is an anti-Semite. So that is an example of where you can, through reaching out, through education, through engagement, the Jewish community was able to really turn someone around, and that, I think, did an enormous amount of good. Compare that with all of the efforts at first, and I'm talking about before the um, you know, allegiance comments from Ilhan Omar, she had a tweet where she had defended saying that Israel hypnotizes the world. She had the all about the Benjamins. And then there were these efforts where a lot of people in good faith, like Chelsea Clinton and Barry Weiss, the great New York Times columnist, sort of reached out and, you know, said, listen, this is why this is offensive. Let me explain. And, and she did apologize. She did say, I'm learning and all this other stuff, only to sort of negate that apology, to negate all of that within a, a couple of weeks. And that is another thing, which is that, I think that is very important to leave open the, the door to sort of say, if you were willing to sort of think about this, then, you know, we do not in the Jewish community believe that it's a life sentence if you utter something and you're a public figure and you said something terrible. We, we, we're not interested in having permanent enemies. We're interested in trying to, you know, sort of under, have everybody understand that this is a, a line. And I think that we've really blown past that with Ilhan Omar after this last week. And that's another thing to sort of keep in mind is that, you know, in the past, these apologies and this process kind of worked. And this time that process really failed. That's a very important insight. Eli. Thank you for that. Um, you know, only because I have a clock, do I have to come to a last question. And there's sure. so many other questions. I'll do them with you some other time. But I, in wrapping up, are you concerned 
that the Democratic Party is going to be hijacked by those who are on the far left, who in some way, due to intersectionality or whatever, make Israel and Jews who support Israel part of the problem, and that in some way the Democratic Party is going to morph so that even those Jews who support the Democratic Party, and 70% of the Jewish community votes Democratic, I don't believe it's going to change, Eli. But in some way, is the Democratic Party going to be a less embracing party of the state of Israel and of American Jews? Well, you asked the right question here. And um, I guess... I would highly recommend a friend of mine named Jamie Kurt, who's a writer, has written a wonderful essay for Tablet on this idea. Because what you're asking is, will the Democratic Party become like the British Labor Party, which is now an anti-Semitic party because its leader is Jeremy Corbyn? I guess I would say we're a long way from that now. We're not there yet. But it, there's a danger because I guess you could say Ilhan Omerism is accepted as a, as a wing within the party on this question. And I think that there is, you know, a lot of hostility, at least towards Benjamin Netanyahu, who may not win his next election, uh, among a lot of Democrats that's sort of beyond that. So, there, so the seeds are there. But I also think that there's an opportunity, and I don't know who it's going to be, for one of the Democrats running for president, maybe it's Amy Klobuchar, we don't know, to go the other direction and say, I don't want my party to become a Corbynite, a labor, like the UK Labour Party. And yes. I think that that would be, that's a great political opportunity. Because yes. Sadly, and I think this could be a huge error on the part of Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and all of these other Democrats running for the nomination, that lane is wide open. And I still think that there are a lot of, forget Jews in the Democratic Party. We know that, you know, 80% of, I forget the number, of American Jews vote Democratic, you know. There's a lot of Americans who are uncomfortable with this. Not just Absolutely. Israel, but a number of those issues. Yes. Look, you... So I, I'd say the struggle, the fight is on. It's not inevitable. Yes. And, but we should be aware of the danger. Eli, I can't thank you enough for giving us some time. And I'm telling you, this is only the first one. I'm going to chase you, Eli. You're doing okay. fabulous work. You continue to do that work. And whenever I can, we'll speak both on the phone and when you're ever in your New York area, you'll sit with me at the table. I appreciate it very, very much. I would love friend. it. Be well. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The thoughts of Eli Lake, syndicated columnist for Bloomberg, who covers national security, foreign policy. And again, this is a very troubling time. It's troubling for people who have grown up in the Democratic Party and who felt at home there. And 70% plus of American Jewry has been at home in the Democratic Party. If you love Israel, it becomes now somewhat problematic. And as Eli says, we'll see if somebody comes along and sees this as an opportunity to become a leader in the Democratic Party party that sort of brings us back to the middle. As always, my thanks to our director, Sloan Copeland, JBS's associate director, Dara Golub, editor, John McDevitt, and to the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.